The highways flows through our countries like the veins in the human body. And every highway have seen some nasty stuff. Accidents, abductions and murders. It's just things that happens in this world we live in. But one highway beats them all. One highway have seen 79 cases of murder and missing people in the last 50 years. It began in 1969, and it goes on until this day. But the story of Highway 16 can't just be clumped up in a short description. The violence that has infected that road for 50 years is vast. Tonight, I will take you for a ride through the Highway of Tears. A ride through time. And of course, we will begin at the starting point. The year it began. 1969. Although the murder of 26 years old Gloria Moody didn't technically take place on Highway 16, it is still considered connected to the other cases that did take place on Highway 16. She was murdered nearby Highway 97, not too far away from where the Highway of Tears runs through. Both highways are connected to each other. Gloria Moody had been on a vacation with her relatives that fall. It was on October 25th that she disappeared. She had been to several bars with her brother, just having a good time with family. But that night she just seems to have disappeared. Her brother stated that she had been right behind him, but then she was just gone. But she wasn't gone for long. On October 26, 1969, the day after her disappearance, she was found dead. She had been stripped naked, she had been raped, and severely beaten by her killer or killers. As a result of the beating, Gloria Moody bled to death, only 26 years old. Gloria, just like many other victims of Highway 16, was an indigenous woman, a native Canadian. The police had three main suspects in the case, but they were never arrested, and so the death of Gloria Moody remains unsolved to this day. I want to be clear about something here. I have 79 cases to cover. Some of these cases doesn't have much info to go on, so some of the cases I describe will be short while some may be a little longer. Tracy Clifton is one of the missing. It isn't clear when exactly she went missing, but it was sometime in the 70s. She had been in an argument with her mother, and in a fit of rebellion and rage, she had run out of her house and started walking by Highway 16. She was never seen again. Micheline Paré, 18 years old, was murdered in July 1970. Just like Gloria Moody, she wasn't technically murdered along the Highway of Tears, but she is still a part of the EPANA project, an organization that investigates 18 cases of missing and murdered women, most of them along the Highway of Tears. Micheline may have been murdered several miles north of Highway 16, by Highway 29, but she is still considered an official victim of the Highway of Tears. 
She was hitching that summer day. Many people hitchhiked back then. Two women remember giving her a ride to an area close to Hudson's Hope, but she would never be seen alive again. It wasn't until August 8 that berry pickers stumbled upon Micheline's decomposing corpse. She had been struck with a blunt object and died. Her death, like so many others, is still unsolved. Helen Claire Frost was only 17 years old when she disappeared. Despite her young age, she had gone through some very tough months. She had given up an infant baby for adoption, her boyfriend had broken up with her, and her roommate was raising a newborn baby in their apartment. She couldn't even be there. It was a constant reminder of her own baby she had given away. On October 13, 1970, Helen told her roommate that she was going out for a walk. The apartment in Prince George where they were living only sat a couple blocks away from where Highway 16 bled through the city. Helen was also an avid hitchhiker. Helen was never seen after leaving the apartment that day. She is still missing, but the likeliest explanation is that she died 49 years ago. That's the thing about the Highway of Tears. It runs through so many empty areas. Areas that provide cover and privacy. The soil is soft so bodies are easy to bury. And if they're not buried there is plenty of scavengers around. A teenage girl walking alone by the Highway of Tears must have seemed like easy pickings for whoever grabbed her. If she was murdered, that is. Some people thought she had run away. But she had left everything she owned in her apartment. No, I don't think she ran away at all. I believe she was murdered by some sexually impulsive killer, but that's just my opinion. Highway 16 is after all the perfect place for a killer to operate. Jean, 18 years old, was out by Highway 16 with her brother on October 14, 1971. They had their bicycles just had an overall good time together. At some point, Jean Samperi's brother decided to ride home to fetch a jacket. When he returned, he heard what sounded like a door slamming. But when he arrived at the source of the noise, nothing was there. No car, no sister. Since that day, so many years ago, Jean Samperi has been missing, and foul play is certainly a likely scenario in this case. The police looked for days, but they just couldn't find her anywhere. To this day, her sister wonders whether the attacker had thrown her off the high cliff, if she has been in the river for all these years. Sadly, I don't think we'll find that out. Gail Ways was a good girl. She told other girls not to do drugs and she volunteered as a guide to those that needed it. She was 19 when she disappeared. It was on October 19, 1973 that Gail disappeared, only 19 years old, and gone she remained for several months. It wasn't until April of 1974 that her new decomposing body was found in a water-filled ditch. She had hitchhiked to her parents in Kamloops the day she disappeared, and someone with bad intentions had picked her up. And the killer in this case is thought to be Bobby Jack Fowler. His DNA was linked to another murder committed on the Highway of Tears many years later, and he is thought to be involved in a handful of other murders as well. The murder of Gail Ways is one of them. Sadly though, Fowler will never stand responsible for the murder of Gail Ways, as he died in prison in 2006. The Highway of Tears had claimed another victim. It wouldn't take long for another victim to be claimed though. This one is also thought to be the handiwork of Bobby Fowler, linked to one of three deaths by his DNA in the early 70s. All deaths occurred around Highway 16 and all three victims were young women that died under similar circumstances. Pamela Darlington was 19 years old. Only a month had gone by since the disappearance of Gail Ways in October and in November Pamela Darlington became the next in line. She had been in a bar on that November night. No one knows who she met there or who she met as she left, but that was the last time she was seen alive. The next morning, a 17-year-old boy was walking his dog as he discovered Pamela's nude body laying face down close to a river.
Pamela had been murdered in Kamloops by Highway 16. Both Pamela and Gail had died under similar circumstances. Maybe Pamela had hitched a ride or maybe someone had just followed her, but there seems to be a clear connection between the victims. Cause of death, the way they were found, and the fact that they looked similar, and they were both young pretty women with flowing hair. The Highway of Tears had a few real monsters throughout the years. Serial killers. It almost seems like the desolate long stretching highway attracts the worst human beings possible. Let's talk a little bit about Bobby Jack Fowler, a man who recently has been dubbed the Highway of Tears killer. In 1995, a woman jumped out of a motel window in Oregon, USA. She still had a rope tied to her ankle, but her screams for help caught attention. That's how Bobby Fowler was caught. He was arrested and sentenced to 16 years in prison. Fowler got lung cancer at some point during his time in prison and died as a result of that cancer in 2006. Now he stands as a suspect for over 16 murders in both the US and Canada. Three American victims, missing young women that I unfortunately don't have time to go into in this video, and then there is 13 of the missing and murdered Highway of Tears victims. He has been proven responsible for the murder of Colleen McMillan, 16 years old in 1974, and a strong suspect in the murder of Pamela Darlington and Gail Ways. Now I'm not an expert, but to me the two victims I just mentioned are probable victims of Bobby. However, I have doubt regarding the 10 other victims along the Highway of Tears. Sure, some of them fit the same sort of description as his proven murders, but it feels more like they are throwing all of these cases against the wall to see what sticks. And unless DNA evidence has been recovered from these cases, I doubt any of it will. Bobby will never see punishment for his crime or crimes, but at least the ones left behind in the rubble the family members, the close ones, can get some sort of closure to one of the most horrific chapters of their life. Colleen, just like so many others, disappeared when she was hitchhiking. She was going to a friend's house but never made it there. She was gone for a month before her nude body was found. Now one thing I noticed is that the American victims picked up along highways that Bobby Fowler is suspected of all were found under similar circumstances, dumped in the elements nude. However, their cases includes one more detail, cause of death. They had been raped and strangled to death. So taking that under consideration, it wouldn't surprise me at all if these three Highway of Tears victims died the same way, which isn't at all far-fetched considering they were found nude. A couple months after the murder of Colleen McMillan, another young girl would disappear along Highway 16. It was in December of 1974 that 14 years old Monica Ignace disappeared. Some people claimed to have seen a young girl being driven in a car, it looked like she didn't want to be there. Some time went by, Monica remained missing until her corpse was found. She had been killed and dumped. Her murder remains unsolved to this day. The Redicops were a nasty family. They harbored a nasty dislike towards the indigenous people in the area. I have no idea why they had such an issue with them, but two brothers in the family had been on trial for homicide in connection to the deaths of two indigenous people. Both deaths occurred two years apart. The first one had occurred in 74. One of the Redicop brothers had struck a young indigenous man with his truck and killed him. But the focus here is the death of 21-year-old Colleen Thomas. She was pregnant at the time and she was standing by the side of the road. That road of course being Highway 16. When Richard Redicop suddenly swerved his car and rammed it right into young Colleen. She died of her injuries and so did her baby. Richard was let off. They said it was an accident, but the eyewitnesses at the time saw him swerve his car. The killing of Corinne had clearly been intentional, but the judge that handled the case had prejudice too. A few years earlier, he too had ran someone over in a drunken stupor. 
he had been left off with a slap on the wrist. But as soon as this dark secret came out, the judge came public recanting his initial sentence of Richard Riddickup. He proclaimed that the death had not been accidental, however, charges was never brought up again. In 77, Corinne Thomas' father demanded a new inquiry, but that investigation too was shut down. All that was left was prejudice, corruption, and a young woman just getting started with her life, dead, because of an angry hillbilly. And so the blood sacrifice had been made. The highway of tears had claimed another victim, but the thirst for more will never disappear. Mary Jane Hill Another native Canadian woman was found dead, stripped naked, near the Highway of Tears in 78. She was 31 years old and left three children behind her in life. There is questions, and there is answers. First off, the coroner decided that her cause of death had been bronchitis, that the death had been natural causes, but natural causes does not mean that a crime hasn't been committed. I mean, how the fuck did she end up nude by the highway? Her daughter, who was only six months old when her mother died, thinks someone left her there, naked and weak. I agree with her. I do believe someone attacked Mary Jane Hill that day. I do believe they assaulted or attempted to assault her and then left her in the elements to die. But sadly, there has been very little investigation done into this cold case. They stamped it as a natural cause of death and no one seems to want to see what had happened before her death, what led up to that death, and why she was found nude by the highway. I smell foul play, but as it looks now, I don't think we'll ever truly find the answer. Monica Jack was the youngest victim yet. She was only 12 when she perished. She was riding her bicycle with a friend. It was like an adventure for her. She was turning 13 in a few days, so her father had given her money for shoes. That's what she was doing that day. She was riding her bike into town almost 12 kilometers away. After the adventure, Monica parted ways with her friend and was not seen alive ever again. She was gone for years. Her skeletal remains weren't found until 1996. Someone had picked her up and murdered her. But the murder of Monica Jack has a slightly happier ending. Her killer, a man named Gary Handlin, was caught in an undercover investigation in 2014, and he would go on to admit to what he had done. The family cheered as Gary Handlin was found guilty for the murder of Monica Jack in 1978. So many years had gone by, and finally there was some closure, even though Monica Jack isn't coming back. Maureen Mosey was hitchhiking that spring day in 1981. A new decade had begun. It was time for a fresh start, as no one had died or gone missing along the Highway of Tears for almost three years. Maybe the levees had been rebuilt. Sure, just about every highway in the world has seen some sort of death or missing people, but what makes Highway 16 so special is the sheer number, the amount of victims. Maureen Mosey would be the first victim of 81. She was 33 years old. A bit older than the other victims, but as we find out as we travel down the timeline of death and tragedy that is Highway 16, death and disappearances can strike anyone from the age of zero to the age of 89. Maureen wasn't missing for long. Just a day later, her body was found. She had been assaulted and murdered, then she had been left to the elements. 81 would be one of the bloodiest years yet, with Maureen being the first of three murder victims. But the difference is that Maureen's murder hasn't been solved. It remains unsolved to this day. Edward Dennis Isaac is one of those very obscure, unknown serial killers. I probably wouldn't even have known he existed if it wasn't for the Highway of Tears. Serial killers have contributed to multiple victims along the highway. Most famous is probably Cody Legebokov. But he wasn't active until around 2010. In the early 80s, Dennis Isaac made his entrance, cementing his place in history as a part of the Highway of Tears. His first victim was Jean Mary Kovacs, 36 years old. She was found in a logging ditch naked. She had been raped and shot in the head four times. 
Even though the first bullet had killed her, Dennis Isaac apparently needed to be sure. Then came November of 1981. Roswitha Fuchsbinder was only 13, but Dennis Isaac had his eyes set on her. She was found naked too. Her body had been slashed, stabbed and mangled. It was a horrible sight to the responding officers, a sight I'm sure will haunt them until the day they die. Nina Marie Joseph became Dennis Isaac's final victim, the only casualty of 82 as far as the Highway of Tears goes. She was only 15. She was found naked, strangled with a string from her jacket. Dennis Isaac appears to be a typical sexual sadist, a man of the same caliber as Ted Bundy and Dennis Rader, only no one really knows who he is. He was arrested in 1986 as one of his former girlfriends who had helped him bury Nina Marie Joseph's body came clean to police. Shelley Basque had turned 16 just a month earlier. She was babysitting with her boyfriend that day when she called her mother. She told her that she was coming home, that she would be there in 15 minutes. She asked her mother if she could cook some pasta, which apparently is noodles. But of course tragedy would rear its ugly face again. It lives in that highway. Shelley Basku never came home. She hasn't been seen since that day and no evidence or trace has ever been found. Six years had gone by. The highway had become peaceful. The cars whizzed by and the seasons changed. But it was a farce. It was the calm before the storm. 1989 was an explosion. And it began in August of 89. An entire family of four. The wife, Doreen Jack, 26. Her husband, also 26. And their two sons, Russell, 9 years old, and Ryan, 4 years old. All of them native Canadians. They just vanished. Poof. Gone. They were heading to a logging camp where they had been offered jobs and so of course that took them out on highway 16, but they just disappeared. An entire family still missing to this day. No trace ever found. Who killed Alberta Williams? No one knows, but she was 24 years old when she died. The year was of course 1989 and Alberta had been out drinking in a bar. She told her friends and family that she was going to an after party, but she disappeared. For three days she was gone. Then an all too familiar sight was found. The corpse of a young woman, murdered, in what is said to have been a horrible way. Her murder remains unsolved, but a podcast, Missing and Murdered Alberta Williams have uncovered new details that may help it finally be solved. You should check that podcast out for a more detailed account of the murder of Alberta Williams. The disappearance of Cecilia Ann Nicole in 1989 is one of those cases that doesn't have much info to find. Her age is said to be unknown, but I found two accounts that both say different ages. One of them claims she was 15 when she went missing and one said that she was 18 when she went missing. Not much more is known. It's said that she was last seen by Highway 16 in Smithers, but police reported she went missing in Vancouver. One thing is for sure though, Cecilia Ann Nicole did go missing in 1989, and no one ever saw her again. In December of 89, a man stumbled upon the human remains of Marnie Blankard, 18 years old. She had been gone for about two weeks, but it seemed like they had finally found her. Her remains had been disturbed by scavenging animals in the two weeks she had been disposed, but it was clearly a murder, and it would take a while for the man responsible to be caught. His name was Brian Peter Arp, and he is responsible for two of the victims who lost their lives on the Highway of Tears. Morney was the first victim, and a woman named Therese Humphrey would be his second victim four years later. The sad thing though is that he could have been caught in 1990 as his DNA was found in connection to the death of Marnie. But the DNA technology was inferior back then and Brian Arp walked free 
only to kill again. He was finally arrested after his second murder in 1993. The first event to take place in 1990 didn't occur on the highway, but instead it took place inside a house that sat close to the highway. It was the Rokon family. The mother Helga, 45 years old, Sherry, 26 years old, Pauline, 19 years old, and the infant baby girl Kimberly, just a few months old. Someone had tried to set the house on fire twice already in early 1990, but in February of that same year, the arsonist finally got what he wanted. The fire consumed all four members of the family. It was a massacre. A massacre that remains unsolved. There was some hope of resurgence in the case, as relatives received an anonymous letter talking about the fire, but as far as I know, it remains unsolved. Just like so many other murders along the Highway of Tears. One thing about the 90s in general is that it is one of the most active decades in the Highway of Tears history. The only other decade to rival that of the 90s is the one we live in now, the 2010s. You'd think the activity would decline as technology progressed and police got better at their jobs, but it really hasn't. There is more solved murders, sure, but there is also an increase in the overall activity. Delphine Nichol was what feels like a typical victim of Highway 16. She was only 15 years old, hitchhiking her way from Smithers along the highway when she disappeared. She is still missing to this day, another one gone, another one lost. What adds even more tragedy to the disappearance is the fact that it was Delphine's cousin, Cecilia Nichol, that had disappeared the year before. The murder of Donna Charlie. 22 years old was brutal. She went missing in August of 1990, and in 1991, her headless corpse was found buried in a shallow grave. There is a pretty clear image of the man responsible, Gerald Smaslett. He was convicted for her murder, but the conviction was later overturned. However, he still sits in prison for several other violent attacks against women, but the murder of Donna seems to be the only murder he has committed. You see, in 2001, Gerald held a woman captive inside a hotel room against her will. She ran out for help, but he had caught up with her, forced her to walk back, and began verbally and physically abusing her. He held her there for four days, not allowing her to wear anything but a bra and panties. It wasn't until the hotel manager came to fix the sink that he found her all bruised. Her kidneys had been damaged from repeated punches, and she had blood in her urine. Gerald was a real piece of shit. One murder occurred in 92 along the Highway of Tears. It was in a household. A husband and wife had been out drinking with another woman all night. The husband suggested that they had a threesome, but he got furious when his wife refused. The evening ended with the husband, Wayne Sullivan, shooting his wife, Maureen Sullivan, killing her. Wayne got arrested, he spent five years in jail and in 97 he was freed. It was argued that the alcohol he had consumed rendered him not responsible for his actions. Well, maybe you shouldn't drink if you lose control to the extent that you commit murder. Therese Humphrey was found nude in a snowbank in February of 93. She was partially frozen and she had been strangled manually and then strangled with a shoelace. Her killer, Brian Arp, probably tried to strangle her by hand, but as many find out, it's not easy to strangle someone with your hands. This was Brian's second murder. The first one was the previously described Morney Blankard in 1989. 94 was a year full of tragedy along the condemning highway of tears. Three teenage girls dead, murdered. The first one was Ramona Wilson, 16 years old. Although she was first to die, she was the last to be found. She disappeared in June of 94, but her body wasn't found until April of 95. She had been hitchhiking 
but when she didn't appear for work the next Monday, her parents reported her missing. Her body was located by the Smithers Airport, she was badly decomposed at that point, and next to her body was a piece of rope, nylon strings, and belongings of Ramona found in a well-placed pile next to her body. Her cause of death is to me unknown, but her mother said that she believes a drunk driver had struck Ramona and in an effort to hide the evidence he had dumped her body next to the airport. One thing speaks against that, the fact that two other young teenage girls would be found dead within a short period of time, and sometime later a 19 year old woman would go missing as well. It's said that Ramona was going to her boyfriend in Morris, but she never reached his house. Her murder remains unsolved. Roxanne Tiara was only 15, yet she had seen some of the worst life can throw at you. She made her living through sex trafficking, and on that July night, Roxanne was going to see a client. But of course, she would never be seen alive again. Her parents didn't even know she was gone until someone found her body by Burns Lake along Highway 16. She had been laying there for a month. The murder of Roxanne Tiara, 15 years old, has never been solved. Alicia Germain was similar to Roxanne. She too was 15 years old and she too made her living through sex trafficking. It was on December 9th that Germain disappeared. But while the other victims remained missing for a while before the decomposing bodies were found, Alicia Germain was found within hours of her murder. She had been dumped next to an elementary school along Highway 16. That makes three victims in one year, all three of them young teenage girls. Two of them lived a high-risk lifestyle, all three of them died in 1994. Sheila Faye Kinekwon, 25 years old, and her three-year-old daughter Christine Kinekwon were both found dead in an apartment along the Highway of Tears. Sheila had been strangled and so had her three-year-old daughter. That same day, the body of Sheila's estranged husband and Christine's father, John Seymour, was found under a bridge. Information is sparse, but I believe the insinuation is that John Seymour strangled his estranged wife and daughter and then killed himself. Lana Derrick was 19 years old when she went missing. It was on October 6th, 1995 that Lana was last seen by a gas station. Eyewitnesses claim they saw the young woman get into a car with two unidentified men. It was said that she had been hitchhiking to her parents' house, but no one really knows. There is no answers as to what happened to Lana Derrick in October of 95 because no one has seen her since that day. She's still missing. <laughs> Bonnie Mooney's abusive ex-husband had killer written all over him. He was possessive, abusive and mean. He had been in jail before for choking Bonnie, but on this day, Bonnie Mooney was away. Home was Bonnie's 12-year-old daughter and a woman named Hazel White. At some point, Roland Kruska, Bonnie's ex-husband, forced his way into the home that sat along the highway. He had a sawed-off shotgun with him and fired at Hazel White. Hazel died and the 12-year-old daughter of Mooney was wounded. Roland then attempted to set the house on fire before blasting his brain away with his shotgun. It was a tragedy, a tragedy forgotten as time has passed. It was the murder of Hazel White in 96. Another year, another mad husband. Wendy Ann Ratt was 44 when she disappeared. It was in August of 97 and no one would ever find her body. But in an undercover sting performed in 2008, her husband Dennis Ratt confessed to an undercover police officer that he had shot his wife and dumped her naked corpse in a wooded area somewhere. He was charged with second-degree murder, he had showed the undercover cops the locations of both murder and dumping grounds. He was caught. He appealed his sentence in 2012, but it was denied. Wendy's corpse was never found, but this is one of those rare cases where they didn't need a corpse to convict. 
Christopher Alexander was drunk. He wanted to rob somebody that night and finally found his way to the front door of Linda Geraldine Lefranc, 36 years old. The young man, 17 years old, put on a disguise and entered her home that sat along the highway with a hidden key. Linda spotted the man and decided to flee. Alexander wouldn't have none of that though. He came to rob her, but something snapped in his mind and suddenly he found himself on top of Linda Geraldine. His hand was covered in the woman's blood, the knife was dripping with the woman's life force. She was dead already, but the young man couldn't stop stabbing her. By the time he was done, he had stabbed her 38 times. And so, poor Geraldine lost her life to a desperate and stupid young man. The tale of Amanda Jean Simpson, four years old, is a tragic and unnecessary one. Her stepfather was abusive to her and to her sister. Her sister had even told a trusted adult that they needed help, that their stepfather was beating them but help couldn't arrive quick enough. Little Amanda Jean was transferred to the Prince George Hospital on October 30, 1999 and when she arrived they noted massive head injuries. Amanda died only four years old and while her stepfather was held responsible he got off. Years later a coroner confirmed the fact that her death was a murder. And I think we all know who was responsible for that. Sadly, he hasn't been brought to justice, beating a small child to death. There is a cowardice to that type of killer that I absolutely despise. He doesn't do it for some sort of brain abnormality, like a sexually sadistic desire, he does it because he is an angry man taking out his inner disappointment on two children that aren't even his own. He is just a piece of shit. Monica McKay was the last victim of the millennia. She fits the criteria perfectly for the Highway of Tears. She was young, only 18, and was slightly hitchhiking in December of 1999. She disappeared and wasn't found until January 8 of 2000. Her naked decomposing body was found next to a dumpster her murder remains unsolved to this day. A brand new millennia, a new beginning, a fresh start to cleanse the filth and darkness that had stained Highway 16 for over 30 years. And the first murder of the new millennia wasn't like the typical Highway of Tears case. It was a jealous ex-husband. People saw Tracy Nadine Jack run across the parking lot. Her ex-husband Gordon Wolf was chasing her with a gun. He was shooting at her and trying to catch her. If he couldn't have her, then no one could. Eventually, Tracy made her way into a Holly Davidson dealership, but Gordon was right behind her. He pushed her to the ground, put a foot on her back to hold her down and shot her in the back of the head, killing her instantly. He then quickly aimed the gun at Tracy's new boyfriend and shot him in the stomach before being wrestled to the ground by employees and onlookers. Tracy's boyfriend survived the shot, but it must have hurt. I hear that being shot in the stomach is the worst. It's the place on the body that hurts the most. Gordon was charged for murder and attempted murder. Murders like these aren't that unusual. They happen everywhere, even in my little Swedish town where there rarely is more than one murder a year. These cases may seem unconnected to the others the hitchhikers and missing women, but they are also a part of the history of the Highway of Tears. They assist to highlight the bloodshed Highway 16 has seen, the curse of the asphalt. Now, I don't believe in curses. There is perfectly good explanations as to why Highway 16 is such an attractive location for killers. It's a long stretch across landscapes. Landscapes covered in trees that stretches for miles and miles on end. It offers cover, privacy and good dumping grounds as there is plenty of scavengers. But at the same time, I feel like there should be other highways out there with the same conditions that doesn't have nearly as many cases in the last 50 years. Now, of course a highway that runs through Detroit, for example, would have a higher number of homicides. 
but those are murders that are focused in one specific area that happens to sit along the highway. These murders are spread along the highway, making Highway 16 the focal point. Savannah Hall was only three years old. It was said she was a violent sleeper. It was also said she suffered from night terrors, a horrifying condition. It is the opposite of sleepwalking. Sleepwalking is when your body is active but your mind is asleep. Night terrors is when the mind is awake but your body is paralyzed in sleep. In this state, hallucinations occur. You can see terrifying figures but you won't be able to move at all. I imagine this would have been hard for a three-year-old to deal with. But I don't understand how she was a violent sleeper and suffered from sleep paralysis at the same time. Regardless, that seems to have been the doctor's verdict. Savannah was held in place with a leather harness in her crib where she slept. She was placed face down in the windowless basement crib and then left alone. But her death is complicated. Someone fucked up. Her treatment was miscarried by both her caretakers and the doctors. The coroner's inquest determined that Savannah's death was a homicide. But it's very hard to find a scapegoat. The foster parents just did what their doctors told them, but others said that Savannah was mistreated in the home. I don't believe the foster parents was malicious towards her. They had cared for many other foster children, without any sort of emotional or physical abuse. But who knows? All I know is that the death of Susanna was unnecessary. Really unnecessary. 41-year-old mother of two, Ada Elaine Brown, was found dead in a hotel room in April of 2001. The coroner determined a subdural hemorrhage and complications from alcoholism was responsible for her demise. A tragic death. But there are some oddities there too. Ada had suffered abuse from someone before she died and she had two black eyes. Her death is undetermined, but her relatives doesn't believe that her death was a tragic misfortune, her body shutting down. Ada had told the doctor that another female had beaten her five days prior to her death, something that may explain the black eyes and bruises. If there is any case on this long, extensive list of deaths and abductions that could be chalked up to natural causes, I believe this one is it, but her death is undetermined really, so who knows. Tyler James Newdorf was in April of 2002 arrested for the second degree murder of his wife Leah Faulkner. Leah Faulkner had been found at a campsite and something wasn't right. She had choked on her own vomit, but that wasn't the only thing. She was blue around the neck. Someone had choked her. It turns out Tyler had choked Leah, 21 years old, until she passed out. Suddenly, she began to vomit, and as a result, choked on that vomit. I do believe the purpose of the asphyxiation in the first place was to kill. But as I have learned, and as you probably has learned too, it is very hard to manually choke someone to death. Like the BTK killer did as he choked two members of the Otero family, believe them to be dead only for them to wake up. But Tyler got what he wanted, and he is without a doubt Leah Marie Faulkner's killer. Her 15 months old son was left behind to live life without his mother. Nicole Hart, 25 years old, was a tree planter. She was an outdoorsy person, happy and kind-hearted. In June of 2002, her friend dropped her off at a service station along Highway 16 where she would hitchhike. But like so many others, Nicole disappeared, and hasn't been seen ever since. The police searched extensively, but no trace was ever found. Another victim of the Highway of Tears, another missing woman probably picked up by an unknown killer. The death of Kayla Rose McKay, 13 years old, or as some other sites suggested 15 years old, is tight-lipped. She was found close to some railway tracks, dead in April 2004, but the coroner ruled out suicide or homicide, but at the same time did not rule out foul play. Two conflicting statements. I don't know what happened to poor Kayla. Her death is a mystery to me, 
just as much as it is to you, sadly. In July of 2004, 71-year-old Helena Jack's body was found inside her garage, sitting next to Highway 16. Someone had beaten her badly and set her corpse on fire. Clues led officers to a hotel room where a man named Vincent Jack was arrested. He is now serving life imprisonment. I don't know whether the murder was sexual or personal. I don't know if Vincent knew Helena before killing her, but the murder displays a disturbing amount of rage or sadism. Or maybe he thought he was practical when he burned the body. Maybe he was just trying to get rid of evidence he may have left on the body. I don't know his motivations. But I do know that he is a killer. A killer that abused and burned an old lady in her own garage. The murder of Barbara Joseph is hidden in shadows. All I know is that the 40-year-old woman disappeared on September 4th, 2004, and her body was found the next day. Her throat had been slashed. The trail led investigators to Barbara's own cousin, Winchester Thomas, who was arrested and charged with the murder. Just like with Helena, I can only speculate in Thomas' motivations. They clearly knew each other as they were cousins, so this murder may have been because of a personal grief. But if all he did was slash her throat, it displays a certain amount of calmness about the whole thing. It wouldn't seem like he was driven purely by rage. But there may be details I don't know about as well. It would be like saying that Nicole Brown Simpson died from having her throat slashed. I'm technically correct, but in reality her head had almost been cut off. It was a rage-fueled throat slashing. This missing persons case is one I don't believe involved any foul play. It was Margaret Nooski, 89 years old, who went missing in October of 2004. She suffered from dementia and was out in the woods, a recipe for disaster. Margaret was never found, so no one knows whether she met her demise at the hands of another or not, but regarding her state of mind and her physical limitations, accidents could easily have occurred. Melanie Dawn Brown was found dead in a Prince George basement sitting close to Highway 16 in December of 2004. Her cause of death was a gunshot to the head. But justice had to wait for her. Why? Because the serious crime unit had to focus on a cannabis growing operation. Organized crime. It may have added to the case going cold because no one has been caught. And no one talks about Melanie, 31 years old anymore. She is a forgotten victim, a murder victim who never found justice. The disappearance of Mary is like many other cases clouded. There is very little information to be found about Mary like her age. I would guess she was in her late 40s or early 50s, but that's just a guess. Mary had been walking to the local mall when she disappeared. She suffered from depression and amnesia so her disappearance may be self-inflicted or accidental. But as she remains missing to this day, it is impossible to say what happened to Mary. Why did she disappear? I don't think Mary's disappearance was a result of foul play. The disappearance of Tamara Chipman, 22 years old, in many ways reminds of the disappearances in the 70s, 80s and 90s. She was a happy outdoorsy person. She was the mother of a young son when she disappeared in September of 2005. She had been hitchhiking along the Highway of Tears, never to be seen again. The new millennia had introduced many different types of deaths, murders and disappearances, but this one was a reflection of the classics. A reflection of the cases that gave the Highway of Tears its infamous status. Candace Komakov had been celebrating the New Year's Eve with a friend that night. By the time 2006 had begun, Candace, 20 years old, her friend, and 19 years old Vernon Wilson made their way back to Candace's apartment. They were all intoxicated, and eventually her friend left. Vernon and Candace began kissing when Candace turned away. This filled Vernon with an uncontrollable rage. He began strangling the young woman. He wouldn't stop until she was dead. What a way to start a new year. Right out of the gate, 2006 would put its own mark in history. Ayela Auger was only 14. She was going to a sleepover that night, but something happened. 
Security cameras had caught her walking towards her home at 1 a.m., but that was the last time she was seen alive, from the eyes of a lens. Eight days after she had disappeared, her lifeless, pale body was found dumped in a ditch next to the highway. That would be Highway 16, of course. The murder of 14 years old Ayela remains unsolved. She and her family still await justice for what was done to their young daughter. Stephanie Joy Donnelly was only 16 when her father snapped. He believed a divine force was telling him to murder his wife, but as his wife was away, he instead stabbed his own teenage daughter three times in the heart and then slashed her throat. He was deemed not guilty by reason of mental disorder and in 2009 he was allowed permissions to be out 28 days at a time. Of course, during one of these permissions, he stabbed someone else, a friend of his. Thankfully, this time, he was held criminally responsible and kept away from the streets. I understand mental disorders is something we can't control, but if someone has a mental disorder that makes them dangerous, they should be kept off the street for the safety of the rest of us. Whoever allowed him to have these free roams should be held responsible for the second stabbing. It's so unnecessary. Beverly Warbrick, a blonde woman in her late 30s, went missing in 2007. That's about all the information about her. It's kinda sad how little there is. She deserves more attention, or we'll never find out what happened to Beverly. The disappearance of Bonnie Marie Joseph reeks of foul play. She was 32 years old. She had five children and was in the middle of a string of court dates to get her kids back from the government. She hitchhiked a lot and that's what she did in the fall of 2007. She was going to one of her court dates. She hadn't missed a single one and of course, like she usually did, she hitchhiked alone. But she was never seen again. She never turned up at court and sometime later her wallet and ID was found near a lake. The wallet contained an uncashed check. I believe something happened to Bonnie that day, 12 years ago. But without a body, it's almost impossible to determine what happened, and such a long time has passed since then, it wouldn't be much of a body left to discover, sadly. We are going to stray from the beaten path a little bit in this segment. Because as far as serial killers go, Cody Legobokov is undoubtedly the most high profile along the Highway of Tears. Cody was only 19 years old when he began his serial killings. His focal point was Highway 16. That's where he would operate. His first victim was 35-year-old Jill Stuchenko, a mother of five who seemingly disappeared in October of 2009. But she was found dead four days later, partially nude in a gravel pit. Her killer had sexually assaulted Jill before hitting her in the head with a blunt object several times. Jill had been involved in the sex trade, a rough way to make a living. It's rare that serial killers begin as early as 19. I mean, we have the infamous child serial killer Mary Bell, but she is without a doubt a very rare exception. Natasha Lee Montgomery became number two for Cody, was three years old, also involved in the sex trade. Her body has never been located but her blood was found close in his apartment and on an axe he owned. Because no body ever was found, her cause of death technically remains unknown. But since Cody is another one of those sexually driven killers, I think it's safe to say he would have assaulted her sexually as well. Cody was stepping his activities up a notch. His first victim had been in October of 2009. His second victim, Natasha, disappeared in August of 2010 and his third victim, Cynthia Mass, went missing in September of 2010. Her body wasn't found until October. The previous victims, Moss was said to have been involved in the sex trade. Cynthia was 35 and she snuffed her light out. She had defensive wounds over her arms and hands. She had been struggling with him, fighting back. But in the end, Cody won the fight. He stabbed Cynthia in the chest a couple of times, before hitting her in the head with a blunt object. She was found dead, her pants had been pulled down to her ankles. 
In November of 2010, a patrol officer pulled Cody's car over. He had been seen coming out of an unused logging wood. The officer suspected poaching. What he found was a lot worse. Cody was covered in blood. When asked why, he said he had been clubbing a deer to death. His reasoning was that he was a redneck, and that's just what they did. Of course the police didn't buy it, it's the dumbest excuse I've heard. The officer went up to investigate the area Cody had come from, and that's when he found 15 years old Lauren Leslie's dead body. There was no excuses, no talking his way out of this one. He had been caught red-handed as they say, and in this case, the phrase was pretty literal. He had met Lauren online, he had talked to her, convinced her to meet him, only to make her his last victim. Cody is still in jail, forever a part of the history of Highway 16. Earlier that same year, a 16-year-old girl drowned close to the Highway of Tears. Her name was Emily Rose McLean. She had been hanging out with some shit people that April night in 2010, yet her death hasn't been classified as a homicide. But it hasn't been determined as accidental either. They simply don't know because drowning is one of those things that can be a result of both. Was Emily murdered? I don't know. What I do know is that she represented the highway of tears, locking its sight onto a new generation of victims. Cassidy Trolley, 17 years old, died in January of 2011. Her death is very unclear. Her mother had told responding officers on the phone that half her face was burned, that her hair was burned off, and that her phone was missing. The police considered the girl's death as a homicide, and it has been said that a 17-year-old boy who knew Cassidy was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. I'm not sure about the arrest part. I could not verify that, although it doesn't exactly sound far-fetched. Madison Scott, 29 years old, had a friend that night. They were going to sleep outside. They were going to a party. They had brought sleeping bags and a tent. They had liquor and other things to occupy their time with out there. But Madison's friend met a young man at the party, whom she decided she wanted to leave with. But Madison had already settled her sleeping bag and tent, so she said that she would stay there. The next day, some partygoers went to clean the camp up. Madison wasn't there. She was gone. As I said, there had been a party, so Madison had not been alone out there with her friend. The last time anyone saw her alive though was between 2.30am and 3am that night. Now she was gone. Her truck was still there. Many valuable items were still inside the truck, but her iPhone 5 was missing. A drunk party out in a campsite surrounded by nature, woods, natural cover. It almost seems inevitable. Now Madison has never been found, but I would be willing to bet money that someone attending the party was responsible for her disappearance. Someone who had been hitting on her throughout the night, someone she may have blown off. I don't know, and obviously I'm not an expert, but I still like to share my thoughts on these things. I say foul play, and I think unless she was transported out of the area, that her body may still be in the vicinity. But eight years has gone by now, but they're still looking at least. The Scott family still wants to find their little girl. To them, there has been absolutely no closure. Maria Rego and her been attacked by a young man. It was October of 2011, and this young man had broken into their home and began beating them, assaulting them. Maria was 47 years old. Sadly, she did not survive the injuries her attacker had caused her. But her husband did pull through. He survived, and a 19-year-old man was arrested for the sudden burst of violence and tragedy he had caused. April Rose Johnson had just married her new husband, and they were visiting friends on some mobile home on the outskirts of Vanderhoof. An emergency call was made, apparently her newlywed had quote unquote dropped the rifle on a counter, causing the rifle to just go off, hitting April in the abdomen. An expert testified at the trial that the rifle wasn't prone to going off like that. 
but it wasn't until 2015 that her husband was arrested, not for murder, which it was, but for misuse of a firearm. Her husband had began dating a new woman very shortly after his young wife had died in the unfortunate mishap, something I believe could be considered motivation. Tara Lee Williams and her husband Blaine was found dead in their home on January 13, 2013. Tara Lee was 40 years old and the double murder that occurred that day remains unsolved. Police were looking for suspects with defensive wounds on hands and arms, but nothing ever came out of it. Since this is a fairly recent murder, since it's unsolved, information about how these two people died is unavailable, at least to me. Although defensive wounds wouldn't exactly suggest a gun was used. And the reason for the defensive wounds would probably be because skin and blood was found under the victim's fingernails, suggesting a more physical altercation. My bet would be blunt force trauma, strangling or maybe a stabbing. Destiny Ray Tom, 21 years old, had been abused by her boyfriend. On that day he had beaten her so badly that she would die. Destiny left a young daughter behind her, just a tragedy, another unnecessary bullshit murder. Immaculate Basil was 26 when she disappeared in the summer of 2013. She had been at a house party and was leaving with her cousin and another man in a truck to go to a cabin. The truck got stuck and Immaculate decided to walk the rest of the way. She hasn't been seen since. Now, the part about the truck may or may not be true, as this version is from the two men themselves. I think they may know more than they're letting on, if you know what I mean. Anita Thorne, 49 years old, went missing in November of 2014. Her disappearance is pretty odd. Her car was found by the side of the road, empty. Why would she just have left it there? Did she leave on her own accord? Did she stop to help someone in need? According to those that knew her, she never turned down helping someone. Is that what happened to Thorne? I don't know. Obviously, if I did I'd be a suspect, but I think that this was foul play. I'm not sure at all though. This... This is a rough one. Roberta Marie Sims disappeared in May of 2017. The police say that she was murdered even though her body hasn't been found and no one has been arrested. What we do know is that her supposed killer had been using her car for some time. Marie also had her small dog with her and the dog was found at the same time as they found her car. I would guess the dog was dead, but that would just be a guess on my part, and I've already done a lot of that. Roberta is still missing, she was 55 when she disappeared, just two years ago. That same year, Frances Brown, 53 years old, also went missing. She was out picking mushrooms in Smithers when she vanished. She was an experienced hiker, but accidents do happen, there may be a connection here. Two women, both in their early to mid 50s, missing in the same year? I mean, if we draw connections between young women murdered and missing within the same year around the same age, then we may have a similar thing happening here. But no evidence of that has ever turned up, and no bodies from neither of the two missing women ever turned up. We're almost there. We're almost at the finish line. Now, 2018 is last year, but it was also a pretty active year as far as tragedy and the Highway of Tears goes. Chantelle Simpson, 34 years old, had gone missing in July of 2018. Wanted posters were put up and eventually her car was found abandoned in a gravel pit. And eventually her body was found too. It was fished out of Skeena River two weeks after her disappearance her cause of death has not been made public, I don't believe that would be the case if it was accidental. I may be wrong on that though. Or maybe they're just not sure. They had to identify Chantel by looking at her tattoos. 
She had been in the water for a while. Abandoned car in a gravel pit makes me think something bad and intentional happened. But she may have had an accident. Regardless of what I think though, her cause of death is officially unknown. Jessica Patrick, 18 years old, disappeared a little more than a year ago today. It was in September of 2018 that she was last seen alive, eating at McDonald's. She was missing for a little while. They looked for her intensely and finally, about 10 days after her disappearance, a set of human remains were found by a mountain road, thrown down a steep hill. Jessica Patrick was murdered by someone last year, but no one has been caught yet. Hopefully she will not become one of the unsolved ones. The case is fairly recent, so there may still be hope. Cynthia Martin, 50 years old, disappeared later that year. She went missing in December of 2018 and her family considers her disappearance to be out of place. Now, maybe this is just me, but I can't help but noting that three women between 50 and 55 years old went missing between 2017 and 2018. Of course, missing does not mean murdered, but at least one of those three disappearances have been classified by police as a homicide. Earlier this year, in July to be precise, 23-year-old Lucas Fowler, an Austrian tourist, and his American girlfriend China Dees, 24 years old, were murdered on the Highway of Tears. They had been seen arguing with a bearded man before their death, but whether he was involved with the murders is unknown. Double murders occurring on the highway aren't very usual, but I guess that is what 2019 will leave behind. Their injuries were so severe, so horribly mutilated, that it took authorities a while to actually identify them. Not much more is known, all that is known is that there is someone on the loose. Someone capable of murdering a young couple in what is said to have been a horrible way. I can say this, for 50 years the Highway of Tears has been a breeding ground for tragedy. It wasn't something that went on in just the 70s or 80s, it wasn't just a hitchhiker stranger danger type of a thing, it's more complicated than that. And trust me when I tell you, the tragedy isn't going to stop. It may lay inactive a few years at a time, but it always comes back. That just seems to be the nature of Highway 16, the nature of the Highway of Tears. <laughs>